Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this H Club open discussion on theatre. I'm Kate Packenham. I'm an independent producer and uh, currently executive producer at the WOW Foundation. I'm going to hand over to our fantastic panel here and let them introduce themselves. So first of all, Juliet. Hello, everybody. I'm Juliet Stevenson and I'm an actor. Kwame. Hi. I'm Kwame Kweyama and I'm the artistic director of The Young Bit. Chris. Hello, I'm Chris Hocking and I'm the principal of Arts Ed. And Anthony. Hello, I'm Anthony Drew and I'm a lyricist working in musical theatre. And your friend here. And this is Sixpence. I think we'll just start with just where each of our panellists, where each of you were um, in your careers and your working lives at the moment that lockdown and the theatre closures um, were, happened. Um, Juliet. Um, well, I was doing a play called The Doctor, um, written by Robert Dyke, um, well, based on, a, based on a 19th century play. Um, by Schnitzler, but but rewritten by Rob Ike and directed by him at the Almeida last year, and we were just about to go into the West End. Um, well, we've just gone. We've just taken the show to the Adelaide Festival in Australia, which was fantastic. A really wonderful, wonderful time at the Arts Festival for about three weeks. We just arrived home, and we we're going to do a short tour to Richmond Theatre and Brighton, and then go into town to go into the um, the Duke of York's. Uh, for about three or four months, and then I was going to go to Broadway with it um, in an American production produced by Scott Rudin. So yeah, pretty pretty sad to have lost mm. that. But very very much hoping that we may be able to do all those things next year. It must be gutting. That must be completely gutting um, just to have it ripped away like that. Um, mm. Palme, where? So obviously you're running the Young Vic. Um, what was the immediate impact on you and how did you handle that? I feel like I'm, I'm being asked, like, where was I when Marvin Gaye died? I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell you actually exactly where, where I was, where I had it on the, on the M1 from Derby to London. Um, uh, so I think, and, and again, it's, it's really hard actually to even remember properly, but we had a, a, a piece on our main stage called Nora, which we had to, uh, to stop and cancel a week before its, its schedule ending. We were in rehearsal for um, Orpheus, a house opera, and we were in week two of that rehearsal. Um, I was in week four of rehearsal for a, a musical that I've written uh, with Tom Kitt called The Visitor that was opening at the Public Theatre in New York. Um, so yeah, though, all of those things kind of happened, uh, were happening at the, the same time. And we had to uh, stand everything down um, over a period of a few days, uh, which was heartbreaking for for all of the artists and 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 for everyone. Really. Do you know yet whether they will return? Um, I, I do not. Yeah. I do not know. I, 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 yeah, I, I, I don't. Chris, you obviously running Arts Ed, which must have been a kind of where were you at in terms of the term and all your students. So we were uh, right bang in the middle of the academic year and still are. We were midway through rehearsals. First year students were in rehearsals for project performances. Second years were at the point just about to perform and we had just done the musical theatre showcase. Uh, the acting students were all on location filming original screenplays as part of their um, final year performances as well. And, and so did you move to online working with them or how have you? So we, we had a bit of a heads up and so we had some forward planning. So one of the first things we had to do uh, was to really train our staff in how to work on Zoom, um, uh, Google Teams and um, um, Microsoft Classrooms very, very quickly. Also, we then took the decision quite early on to film everything that we had done up until that point. So there was some, something that we could do. And then we also filmed the showcase, um, and which is then we were able to send out quite quickly to agents and casting directors, which did actually result in every student um, being signed with an agent, which is fantastic. 
all the editing work that we were doing on our screen, screen work for the third year actors, that was all to be able to take that home and work from home with that. So, and now classes are actually happening online. There's Zoom singing lessons, acting lessons, dance lessons. We're teaching acting for camera via social media and via this medium as well. So it's, it's a challenge, but we're, we're rising to the challenges and we now have a virtual drama school. Great, and Anthony? I was in New York doing a workshop of a new musical with Jerry Mitchell. And it's a show we'd actually done last autumn in Atlanta, but we'd written a lot of changes for it. And so we were workshopping the changes to see if it flowed. And I literally, I heard that Donald Trump was closing the airports to mainland Europe and I thought I better get home quick. So I, I missed the last day of the workshop and got home. But um, I was meant to be, um, Mary Poppins is meant to be on still, obviously, that, um, that only opened in November. So I've been in touch with Cameron McIntosh about the, the future for that. And I'm a, I was supposed to go into rehearsals shortly with Trevor Nunn on a, a new musical based on the book by Eric Kastner, which became The Parent Trap. As a, as a film, we've done a, a musical adaptation of that, all of which is on hold now. In fact, we've put that off for exactly a year. We were gonna open at Nottingham Playhouse and then go to Theatre Royal Bath. And we've, we've literally said, let's delay the whole thing by a year, partly because there's so many uh, young girls in the show and we were trying to gear it around the school summer holiday. So um, yeah, it was devastating really for a lot of people. One of the things that um, we, I sort of, hearing a lot of is people saying um, out of these crises often comes great creative flourishings. And then a lot of friends of mine are saying, I have total inertia, creative inertia. I'm struggling to kind of, you know, th this is the moment, if ever there was a moment to write a book, this is the moment, but it just sort of, it feels like the furthest thing away. I don't know what you're, how creative you're all feeling through this time. Juliet, how about you? Um, it's really interesting, I think. Um, I am feeling, I'm feeling two things, I think. I think creativity, you know, my tradition, I'm an actor, so everything I do is collective. So it's part of a collective creative um, enterprise and I'm one of a team and I, that's probably the thing I love most about theatre or, or what, what we do is that we are an ensemble, but you know, we're, we're in a group of collaborators and we're all completely mutually dependent. And I love that. I loved so much the company I was working with just now and I miss them as friends, but I also miss them as part of my team that we were telling this extraordinary, brilliant story as a team. And so I, I feel helpless without them to that extent and, and, and very aware now of my dependency on, my, on, on being part of a team to be able to make anything. Um, but there's another part of me which I think is capable of, you know, it's difficult to say this, but, but I, I think I am experiencing lockdown and I think a lot of people uh, are in this situation as an extraordinary time when, because the running and the rushing has stopped, I mean, my life is lived all the time at sort of full tilt. You know, I've got, we've got four kids between us. I've always been a hands-on mum. I've always worked. I do quite a lot of political activism and loads of, so it's, it's a full life and I'm running around a lot of the time and I think everybody who's near me think, wishes I would sort of slow down and now, like everybody, you know, we're, we've slowed down, we've gone quiet and although I am doing as much as I can in terms of activism for, for charities I support and so on, trying to raise money and online and things like that, but there is a whole quietness that has descended on us and in that quietness and in that slowing down of schedules and travel and running around, I really do feel things coming, merging to the surface. You know, I keep wanting to write and write things down, scribble stuff down, start a poem, start a story. Um, I've got a whole, you know, table laid out with art materials. I'm just longing to paint and draw. I have made a garden, you know, Hugh and I, my partner and I are making this garden and digging up. We're very lucky to have a garden and we're digging up more and more of the grass to, to grow and grow and grow. And I know that sort of, so I think two things, one of which I feel completely paralyzed, not being having, having my company, being part of, of a group of people in a creative, collective creative endeavor. But I can feel how this time is allowing all sorts of other things to, come to the surface um, and I don't know whether other people also feel that uh, which is in a very very kind of unique and exciting way and it'll probably never happen again and if I don't make use of it you know I shall regret it I think. Mm. Kwame you're obviously uh, interested in your position as you're running a big building as well and as an artist and how how you're managing the kind of business brain the creative brain the family brain I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate in that um, I live with three of my four children and my other 
child lives literally just uh, uh, you know like three minutes walk away. So um, I'm I'm feeling really blessed about the lockdown in in that respect. And then uh, the last time we spent this much time together, I had to pay for a very expensive holiday. So I'm like I'm 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 being really uh, fed by the proximity to my family and uh, and and watching them grow over two months actually and and live through this. I think uh, running an organisation, I think my artistic director ego is 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 very challenged because i'm i'm not doing art I'm, I'm 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 doing administration and i'm looking after our staff and trying to look after along with despin or our ed trying to look after the the economics of keeping an organization afloat during a time like this um as a writer i'm finding it really really wonderful i'm used to sitting up here in my garret before i i became an ad and locking myself away for three weeks for, you know to, to get to the end of a draft and so i'm actually really loving at night when i'm off zoom number 700 of being able to kip for an hour and then kind of jump on and start writing so i'm i'm, I'm actually that part of it is 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 really is really good now i don't know whether on the flip side of it i'll come out and everybody say no brother it really was bad for you <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't actually recognize the man that, that I that I used to know, but from where I stand, my mental health and my creativity at the moment feels really good. I'm pleased to hear it. Chris, how are you finding it? Well, I'm obviously, as principal, my job is to make sure that everybody is as uh, able to do their jobs and as happy as possible, so it's sorting out all the, all the problems. Um, but people are being so unbelievably amazing. The staff have stepped up. They give so many hours above and beyond. They're supporting the students, not only in their training, their education, they're supporting their mental well-being, um, they're supporting their physical well-being and also their professional well-being as well. So I'm trying to be driving everyone through this and saying, we will, do, you will be needed. You will be needed in this business, but you have to make sure you're ready when you are needed. But the students who are about to, to graduate, about to leave, most of them have got brilliant jobs. They were going off to Regent's Park, they were going off to Chichester, they were going into the West End, and my heart is breaking for them, knowing that they leave Art said in two weeks' time, they had these amazing jobs, and now they've got nothing to go to. Mm. And, and Cameron was saying uh, last weekend that there'd be no theatre potential in the West End till next year. So we'll dealing with students who are saying, what am I going to do between now and next March, what, what's going to happen? So we're finding strategies of keeping them positive and um, employable, um, and also working with our current students as well, the current second year students. They're entering into a business where there are no jobs at the moment. So it's making sure that, they get, that they're fit for purpose. Having said all of that, we're being super creative. It's amazing what you can teach online. We were supposed to be having two plays opening this week and next week in our theatres, two commission pieces, and we've actually rewritten them slightly. Well, the writers are doing Babel by Lucy Sheen, and Kate Spencer did a good thing by Vivian Fransman, and now they've been slightly adapted to be plays that can be, other, can be done online and a specific website. So we're finding all sorts of ways of being creative within that. At the same time, um, we have to look after all of our students at this challenging time. Anthony, um, as, a, as a writer, a lot of writer friends have said to me, well, I'm in a, I've been in permanent lockdown my whole life, so nothing's really changed. Have you found that this enforced lockdown, um, obviously you were in New York making, you know, workshopping, but in terms of, have you found it a creative period or sort of stultifying by not being with collaborators? It's a, it's a mixture of the two, actually. I, I got back from New York, I'm down in Kent, so I'm, I'm kind of near my parents and near my, my brother and my niece and nephew. So I've sort of had a bit more family time, if anything, down here. But I, I can't not be creating for very long before I go crazy. So I have been, you know, doing, I've been writing some bits and pieces, but I am used to working with George Stiles. You know, having written with him for 37 years, it's very weird not having him in the room and writing songs over, over a Skype conversation or over a Zoom conversation is not the same as, somehow breathing the same air and, and that process of, of an organic growth of a song. But Drew McConey, the choreographer, um, contacted us and said he was trying to do an online project for 
students and, and, and people who sh would, should be performing at the moment as singers or dancers. And he said, could we devise an online bunch of exercises? So George and I wrote a song called Lockdown and a wonderful choreographer in New York has choreographed it and videoed herself doing all the choreography. Um, Zizi Stralen and, and Tyrone um, Huntley have recorded it and now people are, are doing it. They're, 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 they're posting it and they're labeling it on Instagram so that we can give them pointers. So it's become this sort of community of, of creation, which has been quite inspiring really, because I'm seeing not just what George and I have written, but what some of the other writers have written too, and seeing members of the general public or members of Drew McConey's dance company, having a go at learning the song and trying out the choreography in their front rooms, just to keep that muscle, that mental muscle going. So that was creative and I enjoyed doing it. And I'm doing some art and I'm doing some drawing and I'm doing some, I've started like Julia, I've started a children's book and a musical that George and I wrote years ago called Honk, that was at the National in 2000. Um, we've just, we're just in the throes of developing it for television as a TV series. So I've written episode one of that, which is again, a whole new thing for me to write for TV is something completely different. Just um, thank you. Just thinking about all the kind of online activity that we're seeing theatres and theatre artists like you, Anthony, kind of participating in. I feel personally very torn by it. I was actually just been looking at the Royal Courts. Very interesting piece that uh, Hester Chillingworth. I don't know if anyone's seen it. It's just it's such an installation artist, and it's mm -hmm. a. Um, very worth having a look at but there's such a range of stuff and I feel very torn because I feel desperately I want to get back into it's not there's nothing like the live space that's what we're yeah, yeah. here for but I also think that the, the digital gives us the opportunity for sharing in a way that we can never get um, you can never get to Waterloo you can't get to Waterloo if you're in New York in for six you know it's too expensive what I'd love to know what where and I think this is a sort of ch constantly chip not for me it's a constantly changing sort of battle of um between this but where each of you are in this moment in your relationship to the theater and the digital and the bringing together of them in this moment um Juliet, would you like to start yeah i mean i i, I completely share your sort of ambivalence about it and you know I, i'd also like to sort of preface this by saying this is just my view it's i totally understand that streaming theater and watching it online and is you know it's 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 valid i mean it's it's keeping a lot of people cheered and engaged and, and distracted and involved and all the rest of it i personally feel really strongly that theater is completely that is exactly what theater is not um theater is if, if it's one thing it's people coming together in a room and most of them are in the dark and a few of them in the light and we tell a story one group tells a story to the other group and we share this extraordinary dialogue and every night as we know that the audience you know the relationship between actors and audience is different the text is the same but that relationship is always evolving and changing and, and, and it involves and changes in a way that we don't even understand a lot of what is is communicated is to do with things that are not about language even they're about bodies they're about an atmosphere they're about rhythm they're about silence they're about things that go wrong they're about things in those silences they're about a whole complicated cocktail of ways um of communicating with each other that make this event take place and that is unique to itself and to that group of people in that in that room that night that's completely irreplaceable there's nothing you can do i mean this is not the form it's great in this situation wonderful to have people able to watch stuff but let's not and it's absolutely fantastic to hear what everybody's doing and chris i'm in awe of what you've done with your students and how lucky you know how it's it's terrible to think i'm thinking a lot about young actors and drama students leaving this year and it's absolutely heartbreaking for them and it's terrifying for them and i my heart goes out to all my community all of them because it's going to be very difficult for everyone to survive obviously particularly for young people just starting out and it's so wonderful what you're doing and i've got an idea by the way but i just but i do feel very strongly that let's not be mistaken into thinking that this is a replaceable form online because it really really isn't and it's it's um we need to come together again after this you know my one worry i have is that well everybody will kind of emerge in some shape or form from this period if we do emerge from it and we'll so we'll say well look you know we can do all this online now but obviously not because the one thing theater offers is a chance to come together you know to perhaps 
escape your own personal narrative, the narrative of your own life and concerns and preoccupations and, and join into a collective narrative and the telling of other people's stories and the imagining of other lives. And that's, that's a collective activity, which I think we'll really need so badly. Um, I hope that people will come back and come together and go to live theatre, um, but it's very unsure. I mean, there are so many other hugely crucial things. People need to eat, they need to earn a living. They've got to, you know, they've got to survive illness. They've got to move on having lost their loved ones to COVID-19. Nobody's gonna have much money. There are all sorts of pragmatic concerns, but I passionately hope that the that live performance will not only return, but will flourish and will have a huge part to play in how we emerge from all this. Kwame, thank you. I mean, I think Juliet articulated um, a, a lot of my feelings rather beautifully. Oh, sorry. Am I? Uh, oh, no, I am. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I articulated what I felt rather beautifully. Um, I, I, I would say I've been doing digital theatre for about 10 years at my previous theatre and here. And so the value of it is fantastic, but the value of it is in juxtaposition to what is happening in the live sphere, in the live space. And so um, I, I, I have been very slow to. Uh, to respond, to respond in a digital fashion during this lockdown, because um, I, I think there is an absolute place for it and it's wonderful. But, uh, but right now, I think the challenge for artistic directors in particular is how we, um, how we challenge the thinking uh, that will lead us to believe that we are going to not want to congregate together in a black box of some sort for the next year. I, I think we have to make sure that we signal that, that digital is a byproduct, not the product itself. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, actually on a very practical level, Kwame, presumably, are you as a theatre looking at um, test screening audiences or temperatures or hand sound? I mean, like, are you, are you at that stage of looking at the sort of practical measures that you could put in place to make audiences feel safe or yeah, yeah, yes i think we're, i think we're doing two things um, we're, we're scenario planning like every other theater you know uh, for various reopenings between september and april of next year uh, I, and i think we're also uh, investigating like probably every other theater how do we create a safe um, um socially distanced rehearsal room um or even just a safe rehearsal room and then how we create a safe venue i think most of us know that a social distance theater will economically cripple all of us and um, and that's even before we get to the point of whether people are going to want to come back into those spaces we have been trained probably rather rightly to be very fearful of of, of this this deadly virus um, but it probably takes three times as long to de-fear someone as it does to make them afraid of something and so i think we're also trying to factor that in to when audiences come back in and what kind of environment they may feel safe coming back into. Thank you, Chris. I'm interested, uh, one, it sounds like you've got a, something great to pick up there from Juliet, um, in my, <laughs> but uh, I'm interested with the work that you're doing with your students in terms of um, their, I suppose, their show reels, whether they are performing for camera, whether you're doing all work that's performing for camera or whether there's performance for a, for a stage that you can work with them on on screen as it were i don't know if that even makes sense as a question but yeah it makes absolute total sense um one of the things that the uk is famous for is our conservatoire drama training conservatoire actor training conservatoire musical theatre training we're the best at it in the world and the reason is is because we do it face to face you have one-to-one -one singing lessons, you have one-to-one -one voice lessons, you're in a class of people, like-minded people who are excited and want to explore and want to develop, and you're in a group of 15. You're not sat in a lecture theatre with 65 other people learning the same thing. It's so experiential and everything is so unique to every actor. And, and we're trying to do it online, but you can't replicate teaching somebody in a studio or rehearsing in a studio. That, we could we could never get rid of that. So, but but just to go back to your point, yes, of course, there's there's two there's two different skill sets going on here. So what we're trying to do is to show the business our actors 
acting in a theatre and we're recording that experience and then we're trying to put it together with them in whether they're on set or on location acting for a screen in that way so there's a two different senses so and we don't want the students to get confused either that everything is acting for camera there's not there's theatre there's musical theatre there's big installations and it's really important that we don't lose sight of that by just doing everything online. It's great. Um, Anthony, you've given us a great um, uh, sense of your the work that you're doing. Tell us about Lockdown. Is that the name of the um, song you've recorded? Oh, it's called Lockdown, yeah. It okay, so we can get it on YouTube, can we? Uh, I guess you probably can, yeah. I know um, Drew McConey has made it available to people on Instagram, so I guess it's out there now. Because I do think there's been some great inventiveness for all my kind of sort of protectiveness over the theatrical space. I think there's sort of great joy in inventiveness. And I do hope, I do wonder whether we will use, I hope that we can use, we'll find ways of using digital to particularly encourage younger audiences in a way that we've always been talking about doing, but maybe this will kind of give us an extra kind of, um, uh, sort of uh, sort of power energy to do that. I don't know. Um, that's my hope anyway. That that's where there'll be there'll be a valuable um, sort of upscaling um, of the interchange. Um, so I uh, want. I'm going to go to one of our um, questions from our um, from Elliot Wilson, asking whether there are any positive lessons the performing arts can draw from the experience of lockdown or are we just wanting to go back to the status quo um uh, normal back to normal or new normal kwame i i think we're in the middle of a um, of a portal and we can look behind us and we can say that's the way it was and we can look ahead of us and go i don't quite know what's going to happen on the other side but i'm quite sure that it's not going to be exactly the same way as it was before so i think with without a shadow of a doubt, we're going to have to bake in some innovations on the flip side. That is from audience experience to the creation of the work, to what we talk about and how we talk about it. If I were, I, I would be lying if I said I knew what those innovations would be. Um, but I think that what the lesson that I have learned for Takedown is I have three R's, um, which is to replenish, to rethink, and to reform. And I think those three R's are the things that hopefully when I come out on the other side of the portal, I'll have some answers as to what we, what our sector looks like. Um, but right now, I don't know. But the lessons are, um, let's, let's, let's bake in to our philosophy, the things that we took possibly for granted, or that we thought were extras, and let's bake them into the mix so that we come out on the other side um, with, with a theatre and a society that is uh, better than the one we left before. Mm. Juliet. Well, I, 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 you know, really identify with, with what Kwame is saying. I, I think there's so much talk about, you know, when we emerge, and I suppose the really difficult thing psychologically for us to accept is there isn't going to be like a moment when we all emerge from our tunnels from the dark, you know, there isn't going to be like VE day. There's going to be no, you know, VOC day, victory over COVID day, <laughs> you know, it's going to be a, a, a slow, sinuous, complicated mix of all these things for a while. And we're all longing for that day to come, but it's not going to be a day. So it's a question, I suppose, I think when something is taken away from you, you begin to understand its value. That's just a truth, isn't it? So somebody dies and you suddenly realize and discover all the amazing things about them or you, something, something that you've always taken for granted, as Kwame said, is, is taken from you. Then you really begin, perhaps for the first time, to understand its value and I think that's going on all over the place I think that there's something about as an actor and as a human being as a mother as a, as a performer as I'm, I'm learning a lot about myself I didn't know before because all my structures have been taken away and so I'm up against myself I'm only saying that because I think it's true for everybody and what can I stand what can I can't where, where are my strengths where are my huge numbers of frailties I've encountered um, and I, I think so in a way that the, you know, the, the, there's lots and lots of positives to take into the work that we make, both in terms of you know, what, what is important to us and what's not, that's become very clear. And for lots of people, love. Love has been like a rudder. 
what have you steered yourself towards during lockdown? And many people, many people saying, you know, people they love, people, old friends that they loved and haven't seen or getting in touch with people they haven't been in touch with or making big new relationships with family or getting over the things that separated them or they argued about and seeing the bigger picture. And so this wonderful, so I think we've all learned a lot. The question is, you know, are we going to be able to make make theatre, make, make stuff with it and out of it. And part of me thinks, well, it's not going to be such a huge change. People will always, you know, to some extent, will be the same people. We're not going to be transformed. Um, we'll still want tragedy and comedy, and hopefully we'll still want all those things. It's not like a, a total re-examination um, of who we are. But I think that, and I'll shut up in a minute, but I think a crack, certainly in terms of the world and society and how we live on this planet, a big crack. You know, corona has created this, this fissure and there's a crack and we have seen out of the crack of the way things have always been and we've seen another kind of world and we've seen another way of being in the world and it's cleaner and quieter and less polluting and it's got to be more equal you know i mean if, you know this whole idea that it's an equalizer it's ludicrous people have this 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 virus has polarized you know inequality poverty wealth it, it's polarized the way people you know have um, been able to survive it or not survive it and what it's um, generated for people in terms of adversity is just absolutely unequal and it, it's like it's it's it's, the, it's ripped the wallpaper off the wall and we're now looking at the structure of the house we're all living in and and it's it's full of um it's full of uh woodworm you know and so i'm really really hoping that there won't be a rush to re-establish the status quo but that we will learn what we've seen through that crack and we will take that really seriously forward into our lives. And if our politicians won't do that, which I'm quite sure that most of them will not, then it'll have to be from us. It'll have to be as all changes from the people, from those of us who make stuff, but, but from everybody, you know, saying let's not forget what we learned in this time and let's, let's make it into something that um, makes the world a better place. And also often theatre is a good place to do that. And it's a place that we can be brave. We can recreate structure. Yeah. We can... Um, we can be light, light of foot in that way, partly because we're not um, weighed down by huge economies in the kind of in the sectors that we're mainly working in, um, which is a different question. Chris, I want to just pick up on the question of positives that might come out of it. And actually, something Juliet just said about um, until you've lost it, you don't really know, you know, what it was worth to you. And I've got two children who are absolutely desperate to go back to school. They are. They've never realised how much how important school was so i i wonder whether you think that the kind of when you get to the bringing back together um actually for your students actually the the sort of what that is from a theatrical point of view could um be have could be a positive here i'm trying to feed you a positive i don't mean to what's yours it's very much a positive um the the support and the love that the staff are getting from the students is so, it's just so moving. Um, they're really encouraging us, us, the tutors, to be the best that we can possibly be. And, and that, there, there are challenges there. Some, so for example, some of our dance staff have had their careers in musical theatre on stage, and now what they're doing is they're having to film themselves 25 years later from being a West End performer, doing stuff that they were doing brilliantly and now can't quite do as well because age is, can, be, can be a cruel thing. And so a lot of staff are looking at themselves going, oh, I'm terrible. But what's coming back is the students saying, oh, what you're doing is amazing. I'm learning so much from you. The one-to-one -one training is just so brilliant. And the thing, the message that we're getting as well from the students is they are so desperate to come back because they miss their tribe. They've gone home to their parents, they've gone home to, or, or wherever, or some of them are self-isolating on their own. All they want to do is be with like-minded people who want to create performing arts, create theatre, create musicals, create plays, create something together. And that is something that is so heartwarming to me is that there is this creativity, there's a lid on it. And very soon that creativity is going to explode. So yeah. will we be in the same place? No, we're going to be in a better place. Anthony, do you have a positive reading of, um, of what could come out the other side? I th well, I think, I think we're going to see some interesting writing, as we did after 9-11, when something like this brings the whole world together with a focal point. Stories generate, and it becomes a basis for stories. And I think, you know, what, I, what I've seen in the, in the young people online, in some of the 
some of the projects that have been doing online, there's an enthusiasm and a love for the art form that I think won't go away. We will have to try and reinvent it in some way, but it's like, it's like what Juliet was saying. Um, you're, you, you're, it's a collaborative art form putting on a show and the audience are your final collaborators and to do it without those collaborators there, it doesn't count in the same way. Mm. You know, doing stuff for TV, doing stuff for um, film, it, it doesn't seem to have the same, you write differently. When I write a show, I write, I write in where the audience are allowed to applaud or are they not allowed to applaud and I want the, the song to go straight into the next scene. And that's part of the collaboration with the audience. You, you make a pact with the audience. And I think we've just got to find new ways of making those pacts. I know it's going to be very, very crippling financially, the idea of um, social distancing. And even, even somewhere like the Open Air Theatre has just announced it can't perform this year, which I find so sad because I thought, well, maybe they might get away with it. But, yeah. um, I, I, you know, it's just going to be interesting to see how different producers and different venues can, can react to this. But I know the positive is that the will is there for it to happen. And the will is there to save theatres that are, that are facing the knife. You know, Nuffield Southampton is up for up to calling the receiver. I know the Watermill Theatre down in Newbury is, is, you know, it's such a tiny place. The economics of, of running a building like that are so tight. Mm. And yet there are people starting to form, do go funding campaigns to try and raise money to support, and to, just to nurture the theatres through this gap and the staff of the theatres through this gap. Do you, I mean, I think that the kind of economic point obviously is huge. And um, I imagine for you, Kwame, and Chris, that the furloughing being extended until October in some form, the announcement today is a relief. Um, but I have a concern about risk and the economic um, sort of the downturn and whether and particularly around new writing and whether theatres will feel um, more and more kind of at a time when you know, we've collected learning, where we've gone into some profound places of understanding within ourselves in the local environment and looked out into a global perspective because this is a global um, pandemic, as you say, Juliet, with all the kind of huge chasms between people's experience of it. But this, it's, a, it's a unique moment. Um, that that's a time when we need that we can actually be telling universal stories and that those might need to be new stories. Um, do you think there's a risk to new writing um, because of the economic um, kind of pressure everyone will be under, Kwame? I, I think it's been, I think it's been proven that human nature contracts when it's afraid. When the economy contracts, so does the human heart on the whole. So does our appetite for risk. I think we've seen it after the last 2008 recession, we, we've seen the rise of populism and it, 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 it's taught us that we are not our biggest, um, bravest, most open self um, at moments of contraction. And so actually I think that's probably what we have to, I think I, I was hinting at a bit, we, we have to kind of hardwire we have to kind of sew into the DNA of what it looks like on the flip side. That, that yes, there will be some element of playing it safe, but that all of us can't play it safe. And, and we, needed to be, we need to be charged with making sure that we do not. Um, I, yeah. Do you, do you think, just following up on that, and I'll come to everyone else, but do you think, Kwame, that your, this period has affected your attitude towards the value or purpose of theatre art being an artist do you, I mean do you think it will it's shifting that or reinforcing that in any way no no I, I think I, I I think this is the time that we need artists right it's always crisis is the time where where we fly where we flourish where history comes back to us and says what were the artists saying at this time of crisis you, the politicians are uh, understandably will have to be compromised, will have to play politics. The financiers are going to have to play safe, you know, but, but the artists are charged, again, as Juliet said, with finding the crack and, and opening that crap, crack and, and, and exposing the crap. And, <laughs> uh, and, and it, it, it's, it's, it's a brilliant, it will be a brilliant time to be an artist because we will have to fight tooth and nail 
to not only hold on to what we've already achieved, but to open and create a brave new world. And uh, I'm going to rely on the energy, the untapped, the resourceful energy of the artists. And that's producers, administrative class, actors and writers to come out and, 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 and charge us with, with keeping it real. Juliet, do you want to pick up on that? Well, I, yeah, I absolutely, I, I agree. But I also think, you know, I think there's, I mean, the problem about, you know, everybody's been controlled by fear. Um, as, as was it Kwame was saying, you know, it's easy to induce fear and it's, it's, it's much harder to de-fear. It's a nice verb. I think it's really important that theatre and people who make theatre and music and song and all, I mean, artists in general come out and say to people at the end of this, okay, well, we, we were frightened into submission. We were frightened to letting governments do exactly what they said they needed to do. Um, but in fact, you know, there's a lot of anger. I think, I mean, I feel re raging against this government, the way they've handled this crisis. I think they have, uh, you know, many thousands of lives on their hands. And I think that, um, we are being told and, and, and I'm, I, I'm interested to know whether there's any anger around not, not that anger is necessarily a useful thing but I think it's a creative force and I'm hoping that when we do emerge in whatever form from this period we'll all be hugely celebratory to, to have it behind us to some extent but there's been massive loss along the way many people will have lost their livelihoods their confidence their mental health loved ones I mean there's so much loss and 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 although the um, the virus itself was perhaps inevitable but they were you know there was a lot of warning about this five years ago bill gates gave a ted talk about the coming of this virus he predicted the whole pandemic global pandemic and and that was ignored so i think there's a certain amount of energy coming you know about let, let, let us take our lives back into our own control let us not be persuaded by the spin that politicians the spin machine that the politicians have become let's not have that anymore let's people you know let artists to some extent say to people keep that crack open let's not let them polyfiller that crack up you know when we come out let's not go back to the way things were economically and socially with all that corruption and and the huge discrepancy between the very rich and the poor and the lack of concern or care which this government and, and previous governments have shown let's 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 as artists remind everybody of what we have experienced and learned when we look through that crack and not, and, and not go back but go forward with a sense of taking control of the kind of government we have and the sort of people the quality of the people who are making these decisions about what kind of society we live in and um you know there's there's i mean this is all grand talk you know i don't know whether we're up to this but we need to be part of a culture which is absolutely from the grassroots which says no more of that you know no more of it um yeah um chris um as question an anonymous attendee is asking any advice for actors whose shows have been cancelled any hard advice that you're giving to your students that you could pass on um, all the producers that we have been working with who've cancelled shows, they have been so super supportive and they have said that when things do pick up, they will rehire these people, if not in that show, in another show. So the thing that I'm really emphasising is that they've already, even the, the final year students, they've already made a mark on people and people won't forget that. People will remember what impact they, you made on them and they will call you back in for something else. And yes, there isn't any work going on at the moment, but eventually there will be a lot of work. Every single show will start to kick up again, every TV show, every film. There'll be so many new commercials, so many radio commercials. There will be a lot of work very, very, very quickly. So I just saw um, one of the questions as well that said, I'm in my second year at drama school. Should I um, defer or intermit for a year? And at the moment, I think no, because the time you graduate this time next year in, in the summer, things will really start to pick up again and there will be a lot of work for creators. Well, there's another good question, I think, from Sebastian that I would love um, Kwame and um, Juliet to think about, um, which is how do we ensure, we've done a lot of good work over the last years around improving diversity and representation on our stages. and. Um, there's a you know concern, and it's linked to the question, the conversation around sort of a reversing out of the, sort of the forward movement. How do we ensure that th that movement, those movements, aren't um, stifled, stilted by this moment? Juliet, 
I don't, I, I hope there's no danger. I mean, that's been the most brilliant, brilliant thing in the last few years has been, um, you know, the flowering of diversity, the recognition that, you know, it, um, it was grotesquely unrepresentative and, un, and, and before and this incredible flowering of all kinds of talent from the BAME community and so on. I, I'm, I mean, I feel, I don't know about you, Kwame, I feel confident that there's no stopping that because there's no reason why this pandemic should have stopped that, I don't think. I mean, if, if anything, you know, we've seen how the BAME community have been incredibly unfairly for some whatever reason, and I think it's not clear yet, you know, that they have suffered a great deal more from this disease than, um, so I, th I think that, um, you know, I, I, I'm hoping very much that the incredible creative flowering that's happened with, with this increased diversity and this fantastic, you know, mixture of, of, uh, of a casting cross gender, cross color, cross everything. I'm, I'm, I very much celebrate that and hope that will continue and, and, and flower. I don't see any reason why not, but you're right. You're right to say we must be vigilant about those things, but um, I don't worry for that actually. I, I, I think that, uh, like Juliet, I think in, a, in an odd way that, that much of that is hard bait. However, the little bit of me that is a pessimist um, says that uh, I, I felt that before the rise of populism. I felt that many things that we had won were actually what we'd won was the silence and not the argument. And, and so I'm terribly vigilant to make sure, and I think it's going to be really important, that we articulate, that's the only way we're going to be able to protect those advances, is that we articulate our fears that they may recede in any way, and then we double down and make sure that everybody is committed to holding on to the ground that we have already created and then continuing to innovate in that sphere. Mm -hmm. But we cannot be lazy, we, we, we cannot take it for granted. Every victory that we have won we have to think about it through the lens of the last 10 years, the last five years of populism that has gone forth to undo everything in the name of righteousness. I mean, one of the questions that Stephen, um, another question he's asked, he's saying, shouldn't professional creatives be brought on board by the government to start help problem solving and rethinking how the country as a whole is going to carry on and develop? isn't this really the time when we need different thinkers because politicians are facing something no one was prepared for? And I have to say, just from a kind of representation point of view, I feel very aware of a male um, leadership at the moment on our screens. Like, I, I do feel that we are, um, which is a sort of linked but to the last question, um, but I think let's address Stephen's question about um, where, isn't this where are the creative are creative voices um, being part of conversations with government? It goes to the conversation we're having about structural systems. I don't know if any of you have a view on that or any insight into it, Chris. What I what I understand. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Chris. Um, well, it's just quite interesting reading the forty-eight page document from the government. Um, there's absolutely no reference what's, whatsoever to higher education or drama schools at all. There's just no input from that and um and as i say the, the drama what we produce for the west end for the theater for, for the uh, and for the film uh, world in the uk it's a big big business and just there's no thought into into that supply chain as well so that's that's a bit of a worry that no thought is going into um educating actors and performers and um there there is no voice there at all and you're absolutely right so it's it just feels totally male and each time if a sturgeon comes on screen, I feel like, oh, someone's speaking some sense. Exactly. I mean, saying, I have to say, if you look at all the, the countries which are dealing best with this virus, you know, they are tend to be led by women. I'm just popping that in. But, um, 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 uh, yeah, I mean, I... I, I I, I think that's right. I think that the, there's two things that are very misunderstood. One of which is, as you say, Chris, is that these performing arts industries bring in a huge amount of money. They bring in a lot, huge amount of tourism. They pay an awful lot of tax. They support the catering industries, restaurants, bars, clubs. We all know that. We all know that that how much um, income for government is generated um, by 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 our by our by our industry, and and that's not really ever acknowledged by governments especially not this one but also I think what seriously not acknowledged is the importance of live performance in any society and I mean it's important as a baker the chemist the 
you know, and then you have your, your, your theater in the middle of your town and that's where people go to make ceremonies, to make rituals. Human beings need that. Look at the internet. I mean, it's, we'd only been in, in lockdown about a week when people were making stuff, you know, they were coming out collectively singing these incredible sort of online collective choirs and or people in Italy or even here standing on their balconies outside their front doors singing together. Human beings deeply need to come together to sing or perform or, or ritualize. Um, uh, it's it's absolutely primal and that must that needs to be acknowledged in the reconstruction but it won't be by this government so I think it's a great question whoever asked that question I think it's a great idea that there would be professionals who are drafted in and brought in by government to think about how we support an industry that's absolutely on its knees now and um, won't survive without serious a commitment for serious sort of support financially and in in every other way by, by by the government and they'll certainly not be able to do that themselves so i think it would be great to get um, to get i, I think on a oh, sorry julia no no, no I, i'm done I, I think on a purely mechanical uh way uh there are groups of um of people from the commercial sector the not-for-profit sector i'm um, beginning to have conversations with government right now um about um our needs and about protecting what we have and helping to build what we have, um, what we will do tomorrow. Um, so I, I think that is happening. Do I think that we've got there quite slowly? Do I think that the other sectors have managed to have conversations with government well before we, the narrative makers, that's what we do for a living, have got in and created and sold our narrative? Absolutely. But it's about all governments, right? It's all about what is the role of, our, of the artist? And I think we have to, I, I think government will always do well to, go to the people who think outside of the box in the way that artists do to help shape the narratives of tomorrow. So the question is absolutely correct. Um, should, it, should the government be in, including people who are artistic in decision-making or at least in planning and listening? Yes. Do I think that is happening now? Yes. Do I think that it was, it's a beat too, uh, too not too late, but a beat behind the beat? Uh, absolutely. Um, there's a very specific question here, which we just popped through with everyone from Janet um, Caddick to, to everyone. Do we think that there will be an autumn season of theatre productions? This is crystal ball moment um, for everyone. Um, or is it going to be more like next year? Anthony, do you have a view? Well, my, um, all I can say is having spoke, been talking to Cameron McIntosh about this and his view, which is obviously on the bigger commercial end of the market, he he can't see how... The, the big shows can come back and he, he cites Hamilton and, and Phantom and um, Les Mis and Mary Poppins until social distancing has been eliminated. And even then, maybe not for as many performances a week as we, are, as we were doing. He said, we've got to see if there's an appetite out there for an audience to come back to the theatre and sit in a large crowd. But what you can't do is have two seats empty between adjacent people because a they won't have a good experience because they won't feel like they're part of a, a communion and and it just wouldn't stack up financially so i from, from from about three weeks ago when cameron rang and he said i think we might be able to reopen by about the third week of september his most recent announcement is he thinks it'll probably be around this time next year and a lot of those shows will need an awful long time to re-rehearse and if we can keep the casts together, we'll keep the cast together. But some might have decided they don't want to stay with the show. They might have other work lined up, you know, ahead of that. Um, so I think, it, I suspect for the big shows, it's going to be the spring of next year. I'm going to ask, does anyone on the panel think that it's likely there'll be an autumn season? I don't. Kwame? Um, the, the, the West End producers who are taking our show into town have also, like Anthony says, they're, they're talking next spring. And uh, I can't see that it will, anything much is going to happen in September, October, because it's not the timeline, is it? And it's also not just what the government allows us to do, but it's, it's as everybody's saying, it's what people feel they can do anyway, can afford to, number one, and also feel safe doing, number two. I mean, I would just like to pop in the to the mix I thought about how else we can prepare audiences I mean is there a way in which you know you can have um, systems in place with you know some form of PPE or hand washing or oh, I don't know you're looking looking to other countries like South Korea you know and what they're doing in their schools for example is there a way in which we can support audiences who do want to come back you know in, in terms of helping them to feel safe inside our buildings by taking precautions quite practical precautions but I think um, 
probably I think next I mean, what I'm hearing is that next spring is the earliest really um, um, I, I, I don't know I, 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 I don't know um, I, 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 I don't know it depends on what kind of shows it depends on on what the scale of it it depends on you know on, on audience appetite um, I, I, I believe that science talks to us in in contemporaneous terms it says the science today tells us X and so the science of next week might lead to a totally different way of thinking about this and my job is to keep my mind open as open as humanly possible um, not be caught in a kind of herd mentality that because the big guys say they're not coming back till April that we're all going to go okay then we're not coming back till April we have a different charge in the not-for-profit sector than uh, the commercial sector and, uh, and and I think my job is to remain as open as humanly possible um, we're about to wrap up so I'm going to ask you um, each of you to give up the people who are watching one thing that you've read or watched during lockdown that you would like to recommend telefilm before so you've got a moment to think about that um, before I come back to you on that just to say to the audience that next week um, the H Club are doing these uh, open discussions every week and next week it, the, I think the television one from last week is online now and the film one next week um, is next Wednesday at three o'clock is it Wednesday or is it Tuesday maybe it's Tuesday today Tuesday sorry um, so that's what's happening time's doing weird things so your one recommendation Juliet to the audience uh, I haven't watched much because I've been I'm, I'm, I'm kind of been doing rather than watching I'm too sort of agitated and restless but I've discovered the MASH report I'm probably the last person to the MASH report on Friday nights with Nish Kumar and his completely brilliant team of comic geniuses it's just like that I'm compulsively watching that now so if anybody hasn't yet caught up with the MASH report on Friday nights they really need to and and back editions of it as well because it's co comic political satire at its most genius it's hilarious and it's bitingly satirical and fantastic brilliant Kwame two being greedy unorthodox on Netflix and black AF fucking hilarious okay great we need to laugh um Chris well there's so many things I would like to say but do you know what something that just makes me smile all the time and it's Jane McDonald's cruising <laughs> <laughs> You see all the places around the world. There they are in my in my TV screen. So that makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> and Anthony. Well, I've finally got Netflix, so I've now watched all of The Crown in about the space of about a week, all three seasons. But I also agree, Unorthodox was amazing. I enjoyed Noughts and Crosses, The Stranger, uh, Safe, Hidden. Oh. And wow. I've, That's and cool. I've read. I've read. Um, there was a wonderful um, playwright called Donald Howarth who was a, a fellow member of the Dramatist Club with me, who sadly died about the age 92, I think he was, two or three weeks ago. And I realized I'd never seen any of his plays. So I bought a compilation of his plays and I'm reading Sugar in the Morning at the moment. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for um, being part of this discussion this afternoon. I've personally enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Kate. Thank you, beautifully facilitated, Kate. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.